Well, welcome to once again to Refuge. We want to point you to the safe place in the storm, and his name is Jesus. And uh, we have a special guest this morning, uh, Pastor Dan Finfrock. And Pastor Dan uh, began a ministry 40 years ago now uh, to help equip and train pastors and leaders to study their Bibles, to simply study their Bibles simply, and to teach the Word, to simply teach the Word simply. And this method that he has been training pastors and leaders all over the world for the last 40 years is called inductive Bible study. It's very simple. You just need your Bible and a piece of paper and look at what it says, consider what it means, how are we going to apply it to our lives. And he's traveled all over the world to over 50 different countries, uh, training thousands of pastors and leaders to be able to study their word, the, the Word of God and to teach the Word of God. And I encountered his ministry for the first time as an intern assisting pastor 25 years ago. My wife and I were sent out to uh, attend the conference for a week with Pastor Dan, and it was so rich. And every time that I've encountered his ministry since then, I'm reminded at how foundational uh, this has been to my own personal walk with the Lord and my ministry in teaching and preaching God's Word. And so he blessed us by coming out for our 10-year ministry anniversary, and now he's out once again for our 20-year ministry anniversary. Would you guys welcome Pastor Dan Finfrock? Well, good morning, everybody. It's great to be here with you, and uh, uh, I, I hope I get to come to your next one, uh, 10 more years uh, down the road, so... But uh, anyway, it's been an amazing adventure that the Lord has taken me on through the years. And uh, we had a great weekend. How many of you were here this weekend? Okay. Pretty boring, wasn't it? <laughs> you know, this book is not boring. It, it's alive and it's sharper than a two-edged sword. And sometimes it doesn't make you feel very good. And other times it's wonderful. And, but God's Word is so rich and so... Uh, full of life, and, uh, and, and you've got to get into it. And I, uh, I was a Calvary Chapel pastor for a number of years in California, and uh, I uh, ended up going to the Philippines, and the Lord just began to do a, a, a tremendous work there and began to show me some great needs where pastors really weren't very well trained in their Bible. And uh, so the Lord showed me a system developed a system of Bible study that, that uh, we uh, began to use over there in the Philippines, and then uh, we kept developing it, and uh, eventually we started going to other countries, and, and today I've, I just got back from my 57th country that I've taken inductive Bible study into, and we've had an incredible time uh, in Cambodia uh, working with uh, pastors and leaders and young students and, and you know, just uh, amazing what God is doing. But there's a, there, you know there's a famine in the land? Amos talked about that. But he said it's not for bread and water, but it's for hearing the word of the Lord. And today, we have pastors all over the world, and you got a lot here in this community, they have a Bible in their hand, but they're not teaching it. Many of you may have come from churches where, you know, they, they talk about the Bible, but they don't really teach it. And you guys are very, very blessed to have a pastor that will take you week by week working through systematically, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, because that's the most effective way to teach the Bible. And so uh, we, we've been teaching this course for uh, so many years, but it, it's just been a thrill just to be a part of, a small part of what God is doing. God is moving, and we're, we're, we're in these last days, and folks, Jesus is coming back pretty soon. And we got to be ready, and we got to know what the Bible says. The Bible tells us a lot about what's going to happen in the last days, and, and we cannot be ignorant but we must be uh, understanding and alive. So anyway, uh, hopefully those of you who were in the course this uh, last uh, weekend here, we, we sure had a, a wonderful time. And if you missed it, 
Uh, I really encourage you, we, we did bring some extra materials along. There's some DVDs and there's a manual that goes with it. And you can learn this inductive system. And it will give you a system of Bible study. Most people sitting in our, our churches today, they can read their Bible, but they don't know how to study it. And it's so important to know how to study this book because this book is going to guide you how to live your life. And you have to have a, a, a guide and a direction to know how to get live in all the things that are going on in our world today. And so, anyway, uh, this morning I, I want to uh, do a, a little inductive study with you. And uh, I'm going to take you through a text... In, the, in, our, in our Bible, and I'd like you to turn there to uh, 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 3. And what I'm going to do as I walk you through the verses, I want you to observe how I go through them because I'm going to do three things. First of all, I'm going to get you to observe what the text says. Secondly, I'm going to bring interpretation, what it means. And then thirdly, I'm going to bring some applications. And that's this inductive system. And so uh, watch as we work through the text, and you'll see that happening, and you will realize that's really how your pastor teaches you every week. He's teaching you inductively. Observation, interpretation, and application. So uh, the text that we're working with, I've got to give you a little bit of background. What, what has happened, Peter is writing the church that is being persecuted now. And what has happened is that Nero, who had left the church alone for a long time, is now uh, beginning to have it persecuted because he burned half of Rome and he blamed the church. And so now Christians are coming under tremendous persecution. And, and so Peter is writing the church, and he's in this text that we're going to look at, he's going to give six characteristics of believers living in a very hostile world. And boy, is it ever appropriate for what we're living in today. Because have you noticed how hostile our world has become have you, have you noticed how hostile our, our press and the media have co become towards Israel? And so many things towards believers and Christians are being persecuted. And even football players, you know, who, who uh, profess their faith, you know, the, the media is doing everything they can to cut them off. And, and so we, we live in a world that's filled with hostility. And believe me, I've seen so much of it just coming from Cambodia and learning a little bit more about what happened in Cambodia years ago where a dictator killed more than two million of his own people. And many of those people that he killed were educators. If you had an education and you were teaching in schools or colleges or high schools or uh, you were taken and killed and buried in a grave, and they have what is called the killing fields there. And uh, I, I, when I was there, I said, well, where are the killing fields? And they said, well, every community has their own uh, killing fields. But it was horrible what, what happened, and this hostility, and, and the result of, of killing all the educators is their education level there now is very low. And so we we had a tremendous time teaching them how to get into the Word and how to study the Word. But uh, anyway, Peter is uh, is been talking now about learning to submit one to another and how important submission is. And and, and you and I have to learn to submit. And he talks about submitting uh, to to uh, uh, the workplace and. And places where you're working, you have to learn submission. Yeah, he talks about submitting to the government. And, and boy, the, Nero wasn't exactly a, a right-on guy in putting together a government. And yet he was saying you need to submit and you need to 
uh, pay your taxes. And Jesus talked about that, giving to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, even though there was so much corruption there. And so anyway, he's talking about submission uh, uh, in the workplace. Uh, he's talking about submission to husbands and wives. Wives need to submit to their husbands. Husbands need to submit. And we all need to learn to submit to one another. So submission is a very important part. But then uh, we pick up in chapter 3, verse 8. And I want you to follow along with me as I read our text this morning. And then we'll go back through it verse by verse. But he says, finally, uh, verse 8, chapter 3, All of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another. Love as brothers. Be tenderhearted. Be courteous. Not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, a blessing, knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. For he who would love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayers. But the, the face of the Lord is against those who do evil." And who is he who will harm you if you become a follower of what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you are blessed. And do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks of you the reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, having a good conscience that when they defame you as evildoers... Those who revile your good conduct in Christ will be ashamed. For it is better if it's the will of God to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. Join me in a word of prayer. Father, as we take a look at these verses this morning, we invite your Holy Spirit to come and to, to be our teacher and to guide us and help us to understand what you're saying through your word. Lord, we know that we live in a hostile world. So Lord, help us to apply these principles that, that uh, Peter is giving to the church. Help us to use the word in our own lives and follow its instruction. So we just commit this time to you now in Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. So Peter is going to give us six characteristics of, uh, uh, of how you live in a, in a hostile world. How, how are you to live amongst all these these uh, evil things that are going on. And so I want you to notice first, as he begins in verse 8, he, he, he starts with the word finally. Okay, that, That's a word that most church people are really happy to hear when their pastor has gone for about an hour. <laughs> finally, he's going to wrap it up, okay? But uh, uh, Peter actually is going to not only keep going. He's not going to wrap it up. He has a lot more to say here, but, but uh, he says, finally, all of you be of one mind. You know, it's so important to have one mind. We don't all think alike, but we're to have the mind of Christ. And you and I are to share that mind of Christ that deals with, with uh, he talks about compassion, uh, loving uh, brothers and being tender-hearted and being courteous or humble, and, and and you and I are to to reach out having compassion. You know, it's so hard in a hostile world to have compassion. It's so hard to love people sometimes that are not very lovable. And he wants us to be tender-hearted. And so basically, what he's talking about here in verse eight, first of all is he's talking about you and I are called to be gracious in this hostile world. How gracious are you in the workplace? See, how do you treat your fellow workers? Are you gracious? How gracious are you in your home? How gracious are you to your mate? You see, graciousness is so important. How gracious are you with your children? See, what do they see in you? And, and you and I are called to live in a hostile world and not show more hostility, but the world needs to see graciousness from
from you and me. So that's the first characteristic. It tells us in verse 9, not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, a blessing, knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. And so secondly, what he's calling us to, to do is to be forgiving in this hostile world. And again, that's so hard to do, especially when people do things to us. And I don't know about you, but uh, I, uh, when somebody... Uh, doesn't treat me well, you know, I, my, my response is I want to get even with him. I want to get, get back at him. But he says that you and I are not to return evil for evil, but on the contrary, you give a blessing because that's what we're called to do as believers. We're to bless other people rather than curse them. And so we must be forgiving. I'll never forget a, a, a pastor's wife coming up to me one day when living in the Philippines and and uh, we, we had just got through working through a text, and she was, uh, had been under a lot of conviction. She said, Pastor, I, I, I want you to know that I really struggled with this issue of forgiveness because she said in our church, she said, I, I, uh, I, there was a, a lady in our church who was just cruel to me. And she said, for 20 years, I held a grudge against this lady. And she said it was destroying me. And she said, the Lord spoke to me and said, you need to deal with that. You need to go to her and ask forgiveness. And she said, but she's the one that hurt me. But the Lord said, you've got to go and share and ask for forgiveness for your attitude that you've had towards her. And so she went and she uh, confessed it. And, and she said there was a, a, a sense of healing between the two of us. And she said, every time I saw that woman from now on, from that time on, she said, you know, it's like we were able to accept each other and love each other. But forgiveness is so important. And so often we will hold grudges against other people and we don't let it go. And you and I are called to be forgiving. And then I want you to notice next in our text, in verses 10 through 12, for he who would love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. And so the third <clears throat> characteristic of believers here is that you and I are called to seek peace and pursue it. You see, we've got to control this tongue. And this tongue, often, that's not very pretty, it, 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 especially when you stick it out. You notice how ugly it is? <laughs> and, and this tongue, it, 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 it speaks evil so often. And it gets us in trouble so often. I want you to just take your Bible and turn back to the book of James. Uh, James talks about the tongue in chapter 3. Just turn back there for a second. James chapter 3, and uh, we'll pick up in verse 5. He says, Even so the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how great a force a little fire kindles. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature. And it sets on fire, it's set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird and reptile and creature in the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no man can tame the tongue. It is unruly evil, full of deadly poisons. Wow. What a description of this thing in our mouth. And as you know, our tongue can get us into so much trouble. And, and, and Peter says, as we live in this hostile world, we've got to control our tongue. We have to, in other words, seek peace and pursue it. Are you willing to do that? Seek peace and pursue it? Because the Lord, notice he says, his eyes are upon the righteous he sees you. He sees me. 
His ears are open to their prayers. He hears your prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. In other words, God is going to deal with those people. It's not up to you to deal with them. And so you've got to control this tongue that is in our mouth. Next, I want you to notice in verse uh, 13 and, and 14, he says, and, and who is he who would harm you if you become a follower of what is good? But even if you should suffer right for righteousness' sake, you are blessed. And do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. And so what is... Peter talking about here. He's talking about being courageous in this hostile world. We can't be afraid of what other people are going to try to do to us. You and I do not live in fear. And you know, fear, I have found, is a real crippler. When God wants us to do something, sometimes fear will creep into our hearts and, and, and it will keep us often from doing what God's calling us to do. I, I was uh, going into the Sudan years ago to do a seminar there. I had been asked by Pastor Chuck at Calvary Costa Mesa if I would go in there and do an inductive Bible study seminar. And he was going to send, uh, uh, a, they were going to send a couple doctors and some nurses. And there's about four or five other Calvary Chapel pastors. There would be about 10 of us all told that would be flying, and they were going to charter an airplane and fly us into a certain region in the Sudan. And, and so when he asked me, I, I thought, man, this sounds great. I, I, I'd love to go. And I, I didn't know anything about the Sudan. And so I started reading up on the Sudan. And uh, the more I read up about it, the more uncomfortable I got because I found out they're in the middle of a civil war. In the north, which was Muslim, was fighting against the south, which was Christian. And they were going to fly us right into the middle of that civil war. Now, suddenly, I wasn't quite so excited about this trip. And, and, and so, you know, we're, we're praying about it, and, and my wife and I were just seeking the Lord. And the more I, I thought about it, the more I didn't like it. And, and, and then I got a letter in the mail from this, air, uh, this aircraft company that they're, they're going to fly us in this airline. They're going to take us in there. And they sent a letter... And they asked my wife to sign the letter that she wouldn't sue them if I lost my life on this trip. And so suddenly this trip is becoming more and more scary to me. I, I was not really excited about this trip. And you know, so we're praying, my wife and I. And, and uh, you know, I, I said to my wife, well, what do you think? And my wife says, oh, hon, just go ahead and go. We'll take out a little more insurance on you. Just go. You'll be fine. <laughs> No, she didn't say that. <laughs> Maybe she was thinking that. but. <laughs> and so I'm on an airplane. I'm flying to the Sudan now. And uh, I get to Nairobi. And now I meet up with a team there. And we get on this small aircraft that can fly uh, about 11 people. And uh, that includes a pilot. And our pilot is what is called a mercenary pilot. You know what a mercenary pilot is? Somebody that's crazy to fly where they're going to go. And this guy has to know how to get across the border because the north controls all the borders. And if you go across in the wrong place, the plane's going to get shot down. And so we got through the place. We were so glad. And now we're almost there. We've been flying for almost four hours in this small craft. And I'm sitting right next to the pilot. And the pilot goes, oh, no. Now, that's not something you want to hear from your pilot. <laughs> I go, what? What's wrong? And he goes, look. And I'm looking in the distance, and you can see these black clouds, and lightning is dancing. He says, that storm is coming right this way. And that airstrip that we'll land on, and, it's, and we're getting really close to it, he said, it's dirt. And when the rain hits it, it turns to clay. And he says, my wheels go get stuck in that. And he says, I'm not going to land. I'm going to turn around and go back. And we argued with him. We said, we're almost there. Just, just, just make a landing. And so, and so finally, he said, okay, I'm going to give it one shot. And this guy made one of the fastest landings I've ever made on an airplane. And 
when we landed, we didn't hear the normal things you'd hear, you know, from a, a pilot, you know, welcome to the Sudan airport. <laughs> you know, we know that you got a choice. Thanks for choosing our airline. This guy was screaming at the top of his lungs, get off the airplane. And we opened the door and we threw out my inductive Bible study manuals in a bag and all the medicines and everything the doctors had brought. We got them out the door. And now I'm closing the door. And, and, and I said to the pilot, we'll see you in five days. You know what he said to me? Maybe. <laughs> now that didn't settle well in my soul. It's amazing what one word can do to you. And fear gripped my heart. I'm serious. I was so afraid. And I thought, this guy could care less about us, and uh, he's not going to come back and get us, and, and I'm going to be stuck here. I'm going to die. And the Lord had to speak to me and said, I didn't bring you here to die. I brought you here to minister. Now go minister. And so we did. It was, a, it was just an amazing time. And, uh, you know, the Lord really blessed, but there were so many sick people being treated by the doctors. There was no medicine around, anywhere around. We saw war wounds. I saw the doctor saw a guy's arm off that had gangrene in it. And it was, it was horrible. And, and, and yet, you see, that fear, it's a crippler. And it wanted to keep me from doing what God had called me to do. And so often the enemy will use that in your life and my life to hinder us. And Peter says, you cannot be afraid. Don't be afraid. Don't, uh, don't let their, them trouble you. Don't be afraid of their threats or be troubled. You and I were called to live courageously. By the way, uh, that pilot did not come back and get us, but another one did, praise God. <laughs> and then notice in verse 15, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks the reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. And so, Fifthly, what I want you to see here is you and I, he says, we're to be ready to give a defense to anybody that asks us. Are you ready to share the gospel when somebody says, you know, I, I, you, you're not like everybody else here. What is it about you? Are you ready to share the gospel with them? You know what to do? Or, or, or you say, well, you, let me call pastor. And, and maybe he can kind of help you. No, you have to be ready. You need to know how to share the gospel very simply, not so complex that they can't understand it. Being ready to share the hope. I had a, a pastor friend in the Philippines. He lived in the same city that we lived in. And uh, he uh, was sharing with me how he was invited to go up to Manila, which is about an hour flight from where we lived. And he said, said that he was invited to go to this pastor's conference. There was about 400 pastors at this conference. And he said that uh, uh, the president of the country, which is a woman, Cory Aquino at the time, she had asked this general that was her top man to go and speak to the pastors about some issues that were going on in the country and they wanted the churches to help. And, and so she said, he said that this general got up and he started sharing and talking. And he said, I could just tell as, as he was talking that he wasn't a believer. And, and then he said, the Holy Spirit started prompting me that I was to go and share with him and speak to him and share the gospel. But he said, every argument you can imagine came into my mind. Who do you think you are? This guy is famous. He, he's, he would never give you an audience. You won't be able to talk to him. But he said it was so strong. He said, I, I finally obeyed that voice. And I went up and I, I began to, uh, 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 I, I waited. And, and sure enough, I got an opportunity to talk to this general. And, and he said, the more I talked to him, 
he said, I noticed he was really interested. And I, I started sharing the gospel with him. And, and finally, he said, at a certain point, he said, I said, he said, General, would you like to pray to receive Jesus? And he said, to my amazement, the general said, yes. He said, I, this, this is what you're saying is something that I've been missing in my life. I, I, I know what you're, what you're saying. It's, there's something there. And I want that. And he said, I led that general in a prayer to receive Christ. And that general left that meeting that day a born-again believer. He said five days later, this general was asked by the president to go to a mountainous area where there was a lot of uh, uh, hostility going on and they weren't getting along. And he said, he said this, this, uh, uh, this general was negotiating with both sides. And he was really good at negotiator and they were working away. And he said, all of a sudden, uh, guns came out. And they got really angry and they were shooting at each other. And he said one of the bullets went right through the heart of that general. He died instantly. Five days after inviting Christ to come into his life. And the question is, what would have happened if my pastor friend had been disobedient to the promptings of the Holy Spirit? That general very well could have entered into eternity without Christ. And you understand how important it is that we obey? When the Holy Spirit prompts us, we have to be ready to share that hope that lies within us. And that's what Peter's talking about here. Are you ready to share the hope that lies within you? But you're to do, he says, with meekness and with fear. We're not to do it with pride. We're not to come at people and say, you're going to go to hell. But we're to do it with meekness and with fear. And then sixthly, he says, having a good conscience that they may defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. For it is better if it's the will of God to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. And so sixthly, where he says that you were to have a good conscience, a clear conscience. And I found that is so important in ministry. But it's important for every believer to have a clear conscience. Now, I, I'm sure you will be shocked to hear that somebody that's been married for 52 years to the same woman had an argument with her. But I had a pretty good argument just one time. Uh, how many of you believe that? Uh, usually one a day, okay? But, you know, we got, we got into a pretty good argument. My wife, she's so smart. And boy, she knows how to push my buttons. And she pushed my buttons. And man, I was, I just really got mad. And I remember I said some really harsh things to her. I just blasted her. And then I walked out of the kitchen and I walked to my little study and I slammed the door and I sat down in my chair and I'm sitting there and I'm, and I'm just so angry. And, and all of a sudden, you know that little thing inside? That conscience. It was pricking me. Because I knew I blew it. And, and I knew that I, I, I needed to go and ask for forgiveness, but that was the last thing I wanted to do. And I sat there for a long time. And finally, I went out and I went to my wife and I said, Hun, I'm really sorry. I blew it. What I said to you was evil. It wasn't right. Would you forgive me? You know what my wife did? She slapped me. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> you know what she did? She reached out and she hugged me. And the minute she hugged me, you know what happened with that conscience? It was clear. And you understand, folks, that if you don't deal with your conscience, it's going to affect everything God wants to do through your life. And sometimes, maybe you've had this experience where you went to a person and you said, forgive me, I'm sorry for what I've done. And uh, you're trying to deal with your, your conscience with them. And instead of forgiving you, they blast you even more. And what I've learned over the years is that I can't change anybody. 
I can only deal with my own conscience, my own heart. And once I've said, hey, forgive me, I, I, I can't, uh, you know, and they don't forgive me, it's no longer my problem. And I go on with a clear conscience because I've done everything I can do. But Peter says, you and I, we must live with a clear conscience. Is your conscience clear? Oh, it's so important. It's going to affect everything you do. And so, first of all, I want you to notice, Peter said we must be gracious in this hostile world. Secondly, we've got to be forgiving. Thirdly, we're called to seek peace and pursue it. Fourthly, we've, we're called to be courageous. We can't be afraid. Fifthly, we have to be ready to share the hope that lies within us. And then sixthly, we're to have a good conscience. Six characteristics of believers in a very hostile, hostile environment that they were living in. And folks, I don't have to tell any of you that our, our, our environment we're living in today is, is really getting hostile. And it's going to get worse. And we know that the Bible is very clear prophetically that, that things are going to go south quick. And folks, we're moving there right now. We're moving in a direction in our world. And you and I are called to be strongholds amongst a very evil world. And I've seen so much as I've traveled the world. And, and it, it, it just breaks my heart to see, you know, Christians. Do you, do you know the Ukraine before the war was the largest Christian country in all of Europe. There were more Christians in Ukraine than any other country in, in Europe. And those Christians now have been scattered all over. I was down in Tbilisi, Georgia, doing a seminar down there, and I did an a evening seminar with the church. It's a Calvary Chapel, and, and, and I had so many of, uh, of these uh, Ukrainians that had lost their home, been bombed out, their cities destroyed. They have no place to go back to. And, 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 and they, you know, they, they're, they, they've lost their jobs and they're just refugees. And there's so many of them there. And, and there was a lot of Russians that were there in my seminar that had fled Russia because they didn't want to fight in that war. And, and, the, and, and I'm doing this seminar with them, and, and I'm hearing these stories, and there's just so much hostility that these people are experiencing. And we live in a hostile world, folks. And you and I are called by God to reach out and share the love of Jesus. Because Christ is in you, the hope of glory. Isn't that amazing? And people will see Jesus, and you and I are open books being read by all men. And people need to see Jesus. They don't need to see more hostility. They need to see Jesus. And I really want to encourage you that you would be the church that God has called you to be in these last days. There's so much work to be done in your community. So many people that need Jesus. Are you willing to reach out? Are you willing to do what God's calling you to do? The church must rise up in the last days. Brothers and sisters, we are not here to have a good time in life. Although God will give us many good times in this life but we're here to fight a war against principalities, powers, rulers of darkness. And you and I must get involved in the war. 
And we're not to sit back and just kind of retire, make a lot of money. That's, you know, it's wonderful to have a great job and make lots of money, but we're not here to make lots of money, although God may bless you with money. But we're here to serve the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I want to challenge you this morning. Will you live by these principles that Peter's talking about? These characteristics that are to be seen in you and in me. Let's pray. Father, how we thank you for your word. We thank you for Peter writing to the church that was struggling. And Lord, we, we know that we live in a world today that is struggling. And we know the church is struggling. And there's so many issues that are coming at the church. And so many churches are, are buckling to the world system. And Lord, it's my prayer that you would use this church in a powerful way in these last days. And that you would raise up your people to be a mighty army here in this community and around the surrounding regions, Lord. And that you would send many people out of this church, Lord, to be missionaries because we need them all over the world. But Lord, you know the needs of your people here today. You know the struggles that they go through. Lord, there's nobody here that you don't know every little detail about. And Lord, I pray that, that you would help them to live by these characteristics that Peter has given to us from your word. And Lord, where we have been guilty of hostility, forgive us, Lord. Where we've been guilty of not being willing to share the hope that lies within us, forgive us, Lord. And help us to be the church that you've called us to be. And so I just ask your blessing on this fellowship. What a delight it's been for me to be here with them. And I ask, Lord, that you would just bless them abundantly, the, the, the staff and, and all those that are actively involved in the church, Lord. Bless them and encourage them. Use them mightily in Jesus' name. And everybody said...